Um, I am uh, now going to introduce Dr. Mark Drasner. He's the Director of Heart Failure, Ventricular Assist Device, and Transplant Program at UT Southwestern. On a personal note, Dr. Drasner uh, will soon uh, draft my nephew, uh, Justin Groden, who will join his team. And, um, and as a proud uncle, I am very happy to introduce you, Mark. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Jerry. I'd like to uh, thank Manos and Subash for asking me to participate this year, particularly because this year's uh, symposium is dedicated to Owen. And um, I would just say that at the end of each year, our cardiology division has a, a graduation dinner for the fellows. And year in and year out, the fellows would get up there and attest to how much impact Owen had in their training. And it really was remarkable to see that uh, from an outsider of the EP lab, just to see the influence he had on training the next generation. So it is a particular honor to participate this year. So I'm going to be talking about the uh, state of the art of uh, heart failure treatments. Um, in the limited time I have, I'm just going to first start with what is the treatment algorithm that will cover uh, the vast majority of patients that you all see in your practices. And then talk about some of the newer pharmacological agents, specifically two of them, Ivabradine, and then the novel class of agents, the angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor. And then end on advances in left ventricular assist devices, particularly focusing on the concept of reintroducing pulsatility into continuous flow LVADs. So this is where the treatment of systolic heart failure stood uh, as we entered 2016. And this is taken from the uh, last iteration of the heart failure guidelines. And there are really three uh, agents that uh, have been demonstrated to reduce mortality that all patients should be on, an ACE inhibitor and ARB a beta blocker, an aldosterone antagonist. That's for everyone with systolic heart failure. Then you tailor your treatment to specific indications. If the patient has a wide QRS, they get a CRT device. If they have an EF under 35, an ICD. And if they happen to be African American, then they get the combination of isodyl hydralazine. Digoxin is still on for treating residual symptoms, but as most know, it does not improve survival. And then we control volume using diuretics and sodium restriction. So this algorithm will really take care of or cover the vast majority of patients in your practice as we enter this year. But the scene got a little more complicated. We now have two, no, two new pharmacological agents that have been FDA approved, and the first is Ivabradine. This is the shift publication from Lancet. This was actually from 2010. There's a large study, over 6,000 patients. EF under 35% randomized to Ivabradine uh, versus placebo on top of maximum medical therapy. And these are the key uh, figures uh, from that uh, publication. Um, placebo is in red, Ivabradine is in blue. The top graph shows heart rate reduction. You can see that those patients who got randomized to Ivabradine had a lower heart rate than those who got treated with the placebo. And that was associated with, in the bottom panel, you can see the blue line shows a lower risk of heart failure hospitalization compared to uh, placebo. Ivabradine is an agent, it's a selective sinus node inhibitor, and on average it reduces the heart rate about 10 beats per minute more than placebo. And as I said, the FDA has approved this compound now to reduce heart failure hospitalization in those who have an EF of 35% or lower, who are in sinus rhythm, have a resting heart rate of 70, and either are in maximally tolerated doses of beta blockers or have a contraindication to beta blockers. If you go back and you look at the initial Lancet publication, they did a series of subgroup analyses, and it, it is notable that those subjects who had a heart rate less than 77 beats per minute, there was less benefit than those subjects who started with a higher heart rate. And in fact, the interaction p-value was significant in that publication. I think there remains some question regarding the degree of beta blockade. And as we think about using this compound, I would emphasize that before you reach for this, you certainly want to maximize your beta blockers. There's no question that you want to push as hard as you can on your beta blockers, which we know reduce mortality before you reach for this new compound. And additionally, this has not yet been vetted through the guideline process. The next uh, advance is the ARNES, the angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor. And this is the landmark publication in the New England Journal, uh, uh, Paradigm HF, randomizing patients to uh, this compound, or this, this dual compound, angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor, versus enalapril, kind of the standard uh, therapy with ACE inhibitors. And the thesis here is that by inhibiting neprilysin, you will block its degradation of favorable neurohormones, so you will increase their levels. So really, if you think about this, this is an interesting concept. Rather than neurohormonal antagonism, this is really a case of neurohormonal agonism. We're trying to increase the levels of favorable neurohormones in the body. 
And this is the primary endpoint. This was a composite of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. Uh, and you can see the enalapril is in the dark line. The compound then was called LCC696. And you can see that there was uh, subjects who got the compound, lower risk of heart failure hospitalization or cardiovascular death, a 20% reduction. And also in this publication, mortality itself is looked at, and there was a 16% reduction in all-cause mortality as well. Very impressive result. So let me take you to this cartoon here. And as uh, everyone knows, neurohormonal activation, the activation of the renin system and sympathetic nervous system, kind of sits in the center of the pathophysiology of heart failure. The heart sustains some injury. These pathways get activated. They lead to further toxicity, further hemodynamic disturbances, leads to this concept of remodeling, which then leads to further activation of these pathways. And it's a positive feedback cycle. The heart sustains some injury. These pathways get activated. It leads to further deterioration of cardiac function, which then leads to further activation. And you progressively and inexorably spiral downwards to death unless you interfere with these pathways. That's why we use angiotensin receptor blockers, ACE inhibitors, aldosterone antagonists, and beta blockers. Now, there are the counter-regulatory compounds, the ANP and BNP in this story. They, too, are getting activated, and they, they are essentially the glucagon to the insulin. They are, we believe, favorable compounds exerting favorable effects in the body. And so this is the concept, between, the concept behind the ARNIs. We have some favorable neurohormones, and BNP, ANP, CNP, and some others. They lead to vasodilation, decrease the sympathetic nervous system, naturesis, and diuresis. The favorable neurohormones are degraded by this neutral endopeptidase called neprilysin into inactive fragments. So what we're going to do now is we're going to come in with a neprilysin inhibitor that is going to increase these favorable neurohormonal levels, which will then have favorable effects in the body. So that's the concept behind the NEP inhibitor. But I simplified it because the, the nep, neprilysin does not only inhibit BNP, ANP, and other favorable neurohormones, it also degrades angiotensin II. And so if you just give a NEP inhibitor, you're going to have higher levels of angiotensin, and that exerts unfavorable effects in the body. And that's why you need to combine the neprilysin inhibitor with the angiotensin receptor blocker. And so this compound that's made it to market is really two drugs in one. It's secubitril, that is the neprilysin inhibitor, with valsartan, the angiotensin receptor uh, blocker. It's a BID dose drug, fixed dose combination, the three doses available. I think it's easiest just to think about it as the 50, 100, and 200 milligram doses. Some tips as you start to use this compound or these compounds, do not use it with an ACE inhibitor. You have to stop the ACE inhibitor for at least 36 hours before you give this compound because the risk of angioedema is too high if you combine the ACE inhibitor with this compound. And that's because it also degrade uh, both ACE inhibitors and this compound block the degradation of bradykinin, and you get too much angioedema. You also don't want to use it if a patient's on an ARB because then essentially you'd be giving them two ARBs at once. And then finally, I think when you look at the trial, only 5% of the subjects were African Americans. African Americans are known to have higher rates of angioedema. And so I think we need to see some more data on that as well. Finally, let me move to the advanced spectrum. What I talked about really covered kind of the class 2, 3 patients. Let's move to the advanced spectrum and talk about left ventricular assist devices. Continuous flow LVADs have taken the place of the older generation pulsatile devices because they're more durable. But perhaps there's a subtle penalty for lack of pulsatile flow in the body. High rates of GI bleeding, as the aortic valve doesn't open, it starts to fuse, and you get aortic insufficiency. Perhaps lack of washing out of the aortic root causes strokes. And I want to focus on this concept of the sympathetic nervous system activation, because this is, this is really fascinating. These are data from Ben Levine's lab in concert with our group and David Markham, who was the lead author. And this is looking at a subject who had a pulsatile LVAD on the bottom, and this is a subject who had a non-pulsatile LVAD on top. And I'll f the circles are drawn around the sympathetic nervous system. Each one of these is an activation of the sympathetic nervous system. And what you'll see is that compared to the pulsatile LVAD, 
The subject who had a non-pulsatile LVAD, the sympathetic nervous system is firing like gangbusters. It's going crazy because it's not getting the distension of the carotid baroreceptors. And so the sympathetic nervous system thinks there's not enough blood in the body. And so in the setting of continuous flow non-pulsatile LVADs, there's marked activation of the sympathetic nervous system. This is a nice follow-up study spearheaded again with Ben Levine and Bill Cornwell, who's one of the fellows in our group. Now, instead of comparing pulsatile to non-pulsatile, we did speed changes. And what you can see is that as you increase the speed, the pulse pressure goes down, and you can see that the sympathetic nervous system activation starts to go up. Again, as you, don't, as you have a lack of distension in the carotid baroreceptors, there's marked activation of the sympathetic nervous system. And so the concept is, can we somehow re-engineer pulsatile flow into the LVADs? This is an adult sheet model. This is BIVAD HeartMate 3. And what you can see, this is the native pulse. This is the HeartMate 3 BIVAD. And what they essentially do is they rapidly alternate the speed of the LVAD. They turn it down to 1,500 and then turn it up to 5,500. And they do that 60 times a minute. And when you turn the LVAD down, then you generate this pulse. This is moved from sheep to humans. This is the HeartMate 3. This is a centrifugal flow device, magnetically levitated technology. And for purposes of today, it has this artificial pulse technology built in where the speed goes down and then goes up. And it does that automatically. This was just announced at the Heart Failure Society of America last fall, the HeartMate uh, 3 CE Mark trial. 50 subjects bridge your destination for six months. Six month survival rate was 92%. That was the primary endpoint. It was compared to Intermax registry data of 88% with HeartMate 2. There was no pump thrombosis, no device malfunction, and rates of GI bleeding of 8% and a 12% stroke rate. Again, small numbers, but overall a favorable trial, enough that it is now in a larger trial called Momentum 3. This is an ongoing trial in the United States, 1,000 patients, non inferiority versus the HeartMate 2. Six and 24 month composite of either survival to transplant, myocardial recovery, or LVAD support free of stroke or reoperation to replace the pump. So clearly, if this is a favorable trial, this will lead to an advance in the field and, and a new technology for patients with LVAD. Thank you very much.